He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Last week at breakfast with a friend, she kept reaching for the coffee pot. And uh, finally she apologized. She said, I'm sorry. I'm she said, I stayed up to way past midnight last night reading what, what must have been one of the five best novels I've ever read in my life, and I failed to get the name of it. But it struck me that that's exactly how most people approach this most magical of days. Easter, for many, is like a satisfying end to a good novel. This epilogue of the life of Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the miracle worker, the great teacher, the one who drew the crowds and fed the multitudes and touched the lepers. And then at the end of his amazing career, moving from unknown peasant carpenter's son to challenging the Roman power, and then at the high ending of this satisfying great story is the empty tomb. Jesus is risen. Story over, ah, satisfying end to a great story. Turn off the lamp, fold up the reading glasses, go to sleep. It's a nostalgic approach to the empty tomb. If we treat it as the final work of God in the life of Jesus and just celebrate it once a year like we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence, just to commemorate something that was past. But I also know there are others in the room who just don't think it happened at all. Some of you were drug here to church before going to lunch with the family. And you're willing to dress up and indulge what you consider to be a great fable and tradition. You just don't believe a man actually died and is now alive. So some of you treat this as a great cultural holiday and tradition with hats and eggs and bunnies, but not sure this wild resurrection story has any relevance or is even true. And I understand. In fact, the disciples, the disciples didn't even believe it. Think about that. The guys who walked with Jesus, saw the miracles, cleaned up the baskets full of leftover bread, watched a lame man dance, even they didn't believe the resurrection. A dead man alive? That's too far. In fact, our scripture today tells us that when the disciples first heard the news of the empty tomb, they took it to be an idle tale. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, some other women who told them, in spite of this many witnesses, they just didn't buy it. <laughs> A dead man risen from the dead? That's an idle tale. The first preachers of the resurrection might have been discounted because they were women. Who knows? But interestingly, many in the Christian church still don't believe women should be preachers in spite of the fact that they were the first ones entrusted to preach the resurrection story that would save the world. The women had gone that morning to take ritual spices to prepare the body of Jesus when they found this huge stone rolled away, the tomb empty. They can't make sense of it. There's no way somebody could move that thing. Why would anybody tamper with a grave anyway? And according to Luke, the two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them and asked, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. The reason I say according to Luke is that not all of the Gospels tell this story exactly the same. Not only do they not all agree about how many dazzling angels were present, they don't all agree on the number of women who were there. They don't all agree on the timing of the tomb being opened. They don't all agree on the presence or absence of Jesus. And some skeptics point to these discrepancies as a way of saying, well, see, it didn't really happen. But my response is exactly the opposite. I think the variations strengthen the story 
for one, a tidy little story that emerges out of separate Christian communities exactly the same, not likely. If every count was exactly alike, it would look like they had huddled together to make sure all of their stories matched. Instead, they trusted a plural variety of witnesses with some variations in detail besides who experiences or records the exceptional exactly the same way. For example, I used to do this exercises a lot with senior adult Sunday school classes. I would ask them, take a sheet of paper and write a three-paragraph essay about the assassination of President Kennedy. They all remember where they were. Write an essay and include as many details as you will. Well, then we would go around and everybody would read their accounts and every one of them different. Some of them would tell it in the first person. They would tell where they were that day, what they remember, how they felt. Others would tell it like they were a newspaper reporter on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas. But when I asked for details, that was always interesting. Sometimes the women, never the men, only the women, would remember what Jackie Kennedy was wearing. It was a pink Chanel suit with a pillbox hat for those of you keeping score at home. Some of the men, never the women, some of the men would talk about what kind of limousine it was. I had two men in a Sunday school class in Warrington, North Carolina, almost getting a shouting match over whether it was a Lincoln or a Cadillac. And it was before smartphones, we couldn't check. It was a Lincoln, by the way. Now keep in mind that these people in Sunday school had seen the footage of that horrible day dozens of times and their accounts still varied. But does the variation of account mean that the assassination of President Kennedy did not happen? Well, of course not. And the biblical witness declares the central detail in one unwavering voice, the tomb is empty. In every account, the tomb is empty. He is risen. Everything in the New Testament is pointing to that reality. In fact, the Gospels have been called passion narratives with extended introductions because about half of all the Gospels is dealing with one week in the life of Jesus. Passion Week, Holy Week, takes up about half of the story because everything's building to the resurrection. Because the resurrection of Jesus is the most life-altering event in human history. And the rest of the New Testament is bearing witness to how life is transformed, how life is lived more fully, more lovingly because of Jesus Christ. Every chapter of the New Testament in some way facing Jerusalem. Every telling of the Jesus story has in the background the soundtrack of the resurrection. He is risen and it has recalibrated all of human history. And from that day forward, people have been telling the story over and over. Telling the story that has changed the course of human history and changed the lives of of many of you in this room, somebody told you the story one day and it made all the difference. The women told the disciples, they doubted at first, but when the resurrection became real for them, they told others they couldn't help it. They had to tell others about the size of God's love And as they told others, it transformed one life at a time, passing through the generations as one storyteller bore witness to God's victory over death and how it made a difference in their dead lives. The good news is not a spectator sport. It invigorates people transformed people to tell it again. 
I know for many of you this is not a cute fable or even an exciting ending to the Jesus story. For many of you in this room, the truth of the resurrection is what enlivens your every day. The risen Christ gives your life purpose and drives you toward being the most loving version of yourself. The empty tomb means that ultimate questions have been answered. Fear is diminished. Eternal life, a quality of life, has already started for you. The resurrection changes the way you eat your cereal. All of life is animated by the love of God in Christ. All fear is gone. All people are beloved. All truth is respected. We bend our lives to the call of God in Christ like trees grow toward the sunlight because we know there is a life-giving quality to growing in that direction. For the believer, the victory of the resurrection changes everything. But still, our public response to that change is varied. As we've already said, when the women encountered the resurrection, when they saw that Christ had been risen, it was real to them, and they took off to tell people. When they realized all of the implications that the power of God can make dead things come to life, They couldn't keep the news to themselves. And even though the first to hear were skeptical, remember, it's just an idle tale, the women kept telling it and kept telling it because some news is too good to keep. But in our scripture for today, it says that one of the disciples, Peter, was curious enough to go check things out for himself. He ran to the tomb, he peeked in, And all he saw was a pile of linen burial clothes, and he went home amazed. So apparently, at first Peter had an Easter story that was told to him, but it was not yet personal for him. And I know those people who come to church and sing the hymns and peek into an empty tomb and go home amazed but have not yet fully realized what the risen Christ can mean for them. We know, of course, that eventually the resurrection does become personal for Peter. He he eventually joins the women as an early preacher of the resurrection. And in his first sermon, recorded in Acts, he ends the sermon by saying this, Beginning from the baptism of John to that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. From that day until now, when lives are changed by an empty tomb, you are ordained a witness. That is our vocation as a Christ follower. You and I are called on to, do, to be more than amazed at the pile of empty burial clothes, we're called to be witnesses to the love of God and the transforming power of the resurrection. Now let me be more clear about what I mean by being a witness. That doesn't mean you should go grab a handful of tracks and assault people at the Marta station. That's not what I'm talking about. If you died tonight, no. Anne Lamott once said, you don't always have to chop with the sword of truth. You can point with it too. A witness is simply someone who tells or writes about what he or she has experienced. That's all. In April 2012, I witnessed a perfect game in baseball. No hits, no walks, no base runners. In 140 years of Major League Baseball history and more than 2,010 games played, or 210,000 games played, only 23 perfect games have ever been pitched. And I was there in Seattle 
when Philip Humber of the Chicago White Sox threw only 96 pitches to pitch a perfect game against the Seattle Mariners. And I hope you'll ask me about it. If you do, I'm going to bear witness. In fact, if the topic gets anywhere close to what's a great sporting event you've ever been to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the story about the perfect game and say, I can't help it. I get. Now, when people sit next to me in the plane, I don't say, I ever told you about the time I saw a perfect game? No. But if the conversation moves there, I tell, get excited about it. I was a witness. Or ask me about a friend of mine who, who was extraordinarily wealthy and lost it all. He was sleeping on a mattress in an otherwise empty house because his love of drinking had more power over him than his love of anything else in his life. And then God's love found him. The power of the risen Christ became real to him. And when he was somewhere near the bottom and God's love captivated him, he rebuilt his financial success. But more importantly, he found practical everyday ways in the power of an empty tomb, in God's power over death, that he could translate that into power over what was killing him. The resurrected Jesus saved him, and I saw it. Now I tell that story. I bear witness to the power of the resurrection. I don't ring doorbells on Saturday mornings, but if we get close enough to that conversation, I will tell you, I have seen God's power in the love of Jesus Christ transform it's just being a witness. Part of our calling is to put ourselves and our families in the circle where these stories are told. We gather here each Sunday because this is the place the resurrection story gets retold. This morning when Cece said, well, because that cave was empty, she heard that story here. We hear from witnesses here. We read the biblical story of the ancient witnesses who saw Jesus give sight to the blind, who heard Peter preach at Pentecost. But we also hear new stories of repaired relationships, poor children being tutored and clean water wells being dug in Haiti and other modern stories of God making dead things come alive. Resurrection stories are told here all the time. We come here to bear witness to the way God is bringing new life, and then we go from here to tell those stories to a world that is so desperate to know there is something bigger, something stronger, more compelling, more real than making this month's quota. The women at the tomb came telling the good news of Jesus' resurrection and retelling that story over and over. Witness after witness has carried that tradition forward for more than 2,000 years. But don't take it for granted. Melody Malike, our current deacon chair, and her husband Steve just got back recently from a trip to Amsterdam. Steve was on business. Melody was tagging along. One free afternoon, they took a tour. Tour guide took them to the city. And he said, we're going to the heart of the city, and we're going to see two historic buildings, the church and the city hall. The historic church contained the tomb of William of Orange, king of England in the late 17th century. He said, seeing the church and the tomb, that might be of interest. But the, but the guide explained that City Hall was the important building. That's the one that's important. Not just for the building itself, the architecture and all that. But that's where the business of the people takes place, including the weddings, he said. Weddings used to happen over at the, at the church, but not anymore. He said the Netherlands is not, you know, a religious country anymore and so the church is just kind of a historic building. That's what happens when people lose their vocation as a witness. 
the church has become a historic building rather than an incubator of faith. Most of you are here today because at some point in your life, the risen Christ became real to you. Not just a good ending to a story. You realized that life was fundamentally different and richer because he lives. And so for some, today might be the occasion to reclaim your vocation as a witness. To recommit to being here with your family, to hear the stories told, to have your faith sharpened, to be formed as a witness to the love of God in Christ. But others in here may have never experienced the empty tomb in any personal way. Never been enveloped by the forgiveness and grace of God. And you'd like to know more about what that life, that abundant life, looks like. And still others might have decided that today, this Easter Sunday, might be the day to join your life with this church in membership to throw yourself in with us, to be committed to becoming a witness to Christ's love with us. However God is moving in your life today, we invite you to respond as we stand and sing the good news.